In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So Team Grace, we're in ordinary time, and ordinary time is all about what? Discipleship. And we have to take that very much to heart, that throughout the season of ordinary time, Mother Church, drawing from the sacred scriptures, highlights essential aspects of what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. You see, being a disciple means that we've looked at Jesus Christ and we've said, I see in him the fulfillment of all my hopes and dreams. Everything I could ever want are fulfilled in him. I choose Christ. And that personal decision for Jesus Christ makes all the difference. It fans into flame the graces of the holy sacraments. It allows us to receive the power and the internal strength we need in order to remain faithful to the Lord's way. We know that the Christian way of life is not easy. It cannot be lived without grace. So we have to constantly avail ourselves to grace, cooperating with grace, working out our salvation in Jesus Christ. And it all begins with that fundamental decision, I choose Christ. Now that decision is not just simply made once, one and done. Once that decision is made, we have to renew that in a hundred of different ways every day. When I want to say something unkind, I silence my tongue because Jesus Christ is Lord. When I want to gossip and just really just give someone their due and just go for it, right? And just yell at them and scream, I pause. I silence my tongue because Jesus Christ is Lord. When I want to return unkindness with unkindness, I pause myself because Jesus Christ is Lord. When I want vengeance upon someone rather than showing mercy, I die to myself because Jesus Christ is Lord. You see how that decision is played out in hundreds of different ways every day. The Lord constantly calling us to be different from the unbeliever, calling us to be salt, light, and leaven in the midst of a fallen world. The Holy Spirit takes seriously the commitment we've made to follow the way of the Lord Jesus, and he gives us the grace in order to do it faithfully. We have to understand what it means to be a Christian, to have made that decision. So oftentimes what happens, we have people who say, yes, I follow the Lord, but they don't really. They live as the unbeliever, they think as the unbeliever, they go along with the ideologies of a fallen world. They come, they lie before God. They give what the Lord Jesus calls lip service. You know, the Lord tells us he doesn't need our lip service. He wants our integrity. If we say it, we should do our best to do it. And we're fallen, we're going to fail, but we get back up and we do our best. But we can't say one thing and then just not even try. Jesus Christ is Lord. We say it with such boldness and such devotion until we're out in the midst of the world. And suddenly we speak as the unbeliever. We are cruel as the unbeliever. We follow the ideologies of the unbeliever. Our way of life is different. It's difficult. It is the most excellent way of love. It is the only path to eternal life. It is the path of Jesus Christ, which means it is the path of the cross. Are we willing to love the Lord Jesus enough to embrace our cross and to do all that he asks of us. Today in the gospel, Mother Church, echoing the teachings of the Lord Jesus, reminds us of the Lord's own call to repentance. What do we see? The Lord begins his public ministry, goes throughout Galilee, his home region. And what is his message? Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Such a simple message, isn't it? And yet it changes everything. To seek every day to be a work in progress to desire the ongoing conversion that happens by the workings of grace, to desire every day to repent. I didn't do this. I should have done that. To repent before God and to believe. Lord, I believe in you. I choose you. If we were to take that simple message and put it in contemporary speech, what would it look like? Go to confession and make your personal decision for Jesus Christ. Dear friends, I'm going to tell you, if you ever hear a Catholic priest preaching and he doesn't talk about repentance or confession, be cautious of his message. Because if the Lord himself could begin and mark his entire public ministry with the message, repent and believe, and a priest is not echoing that message, then eventually he's just going to lie to you. You're great. You're wonderful. You don't have to change. You should be exactly as you are. Those are all lies. We want to believe them because we ultimately want to worship ourselves. We want to indulge self-idolatry. But if we're honest before God, the message of the Lord Jesus actually gives us comfort. Oh, good. <laughs> the Lord of all, the long-awaited Messiah, actually says repent and believe. That means he's not expecting us to be perfect. 
He's calling us to repentance because he realized there's something wrong with us and we have to change. And he wants to guide us and help us in that change. He wants to give us his own life, his own power. That's called grace. He wants to give grace in order to help us because he realizes the struggle that's before us. But we have to be willing to repent and believe, dear friends. When was the last time you went to confession? Here at Our Lady Grace, we speak frequently about confession. It's so important i said to you many times, the spiritual masters to the one have indicated that if we want to grow in holiness, if we want a life of virtue, we must be regularly receiving the sacrament of confession. I've encouraged you to go monthly. In fact, I'm so serious about that that every first Friday of this, of the, in this parish, every first Friday, confessions are heard till midnight. And then we pick it back up on first Saturday. And confessions are available on Monday night, Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, Saturday afternoon. And I am available whenever you might need me. Because it's that important. If words do not convince you, then at least let actions do. If you want to follow the way of the Lord Jesus, you must repent and believe. The Lord has blessed us with the sacrament in order for us to go and to receive his mercy, his consolation. And yet there's still many among us who will not accept the most basic message of the Lord Jesus. Repent! Repent! And believe. By going to confession, we receive the grace in order to renew the commitment we've made, to renew that decision for Jesus Christ. We live in a world that tells us God doesn't exist, right and wrong aren't real, and prayer has no power. We have to, we have to breathe that gas every day in the midst of our lives. And yet in the midst of that, we have to remind ourselves these are lies. Lie after lie after lie. No, God is real, living and true. He sent his son to redeem us from sin. Right and wrong are true, and by knowing what is right and cooperating with grace, we can work out our salvation in Jesus Christ. And prayer has a power that we cannot understand in this fallen world. That's our way of life. In order for us to do it, we need grace. We need to constantly cooperate with what God is asking us to do. And we have to hold to the firm belief, Jesus Christ is Lord. I choose Christ. Have you chosen Christ, dear friends? I'm talking about in the inner recesses of your heart with all that you are. Have you said Jesus Christ is Lord? Pope St. John Paul II would constantly bemoan that the greatest struggles of the church is that we have people who come who warm pews, who claim to be Catholic Christians, but have never in their hearts declared Jesus Christ is Lord. They do all the cultural things that are the marks of our faith, but Jesus Christ has not truly gotten into their hearts. And friends, until that happens, none of this makes sense. And you turn sacramentals, which should be means of help to growing in holiness, you turn sacramentals into idols. I've heard people say, oh, I have to make sure I wear my scapular. Let me tell you, if you haven't declared Jesus Christ as Lord, that scapular won't do anything other than drag you straight to hell. The sacramentals have no power, no authority. They provide no consolation, nothing. You turn what is meant as a sacramental into jewelry or some act of superstition. And that goes for the rosary and all of our other beautiful devotions, which are gifts to us, because once we made the decision for Jesus Christ, then they can assist us to constantly live that consecration to Jesus Christ, to say yes to what he asks and no to what he forbids. We have to be willing to do that. Today, Mother Church gives us that beautiful account of the Lord Jesus beginning his ministry in Galilee, giving that call, that command, repent and believe. And during this ordinary time, Mother Church echoes that to each of us. Repent, dear friends, repent and believe in the gospel. And that's a summons to each of us in our own discipleship. But we know that during ordinary time, not only do we look at our own discipleship, but when we become Christians and we begin to live the Christian way of life, we're not in this alone. We have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ in the midst of the church within the covenant God has given us, us. And so we have to make sure that when we're assessing our own discipleship, we also look at the discipleship of our community of faith. How are we doing in that area? Well, the bishops of the church are helping us. The shepherds here in the United States have called us to a national Eucharistic revival. And we have this revival because 70%, 70% of our own do not believe in the Lord's true presence. This is the heart of everything we do. To know that Jesus Christ, our Lord, has fulfilled his command, his promise, I will not leave you orphaned, and that he's still with us. The belief in that fulfillment of promise in the most holy sacrament, to know that he is with us in the Eucharist, is the heart of everything we do. 
Because if the Lord lied about that and we're not children, we actually are orphans, then none of the other aspects of our faith make any sense. So the bishops have called us to conversion. Call us to deepen our own Eucharistic faith and our own Eucharistic devotion. To once again turn to Jesus Christ and realize that the Lord is with us. He has pitched his tent. He dwells among us. He wants to accompany us and be a part of our lives. He wants to walk with us through the struggles of this life and so welcome us and usher us into eternal life. But 70% don't believe that. 70% don't believe that. And they still come to Mass. They still come to Mass. Now, in one sense, that's a great hope because if they're willing to accept help, to ask for spiritual guidance, then there's great hope. And the Holy Spirit can work with that person. But if they simply come and they've kind of shrugged it off and they've just gotten used to their disbelief and they're not willing to do anything about it, then I need to make sure I speak very clearly and you understand if that's you, that you are mocking God. You come into his own house before his altar and you are mocking God. Because you are saying one thing, you are participating in a sacrament given by God to us while you do not believe and you're not trying to do anything about that disbelief. Remember we spoke about the difference between voluntary and involuntary doubt? The Catechism of the Catholic Church explained it. Voluntary doubt is when we don't believe something, we're not sure about something, and we're not going to do anything about it. Voluntary, we choose it. It comes and we just make it a part of us. And that's the case with some Catholics. They come, they sit, they warm a pew. They don't believe Jesus Christ is Lord. They don't believe in the power of the sacraments. They're not going to go to confession. They don't believe in the Lord's true presence. They're not going to live the Christian way of life. They believe that you can slaughter the unborn. Two men can get married or two women can get married. The insanity of a fallen world. They believe all that hook, line, and sinker. Yet they come before the altar of God and they say, no, I believe you. I trust you. No, you don't. You're a liar. You come before the very altar of God and you're going to lie to him. You mock God. That's voluntary doubt. Involuntary doubt, this is what gives us hope. Huh? Involuntary doubt is when something comes upon our minds and, and we're not sure and we're struggling with an aspect of our faith. Perhaps the Lord's true presence. And so we seek spiritual guidance. We begin to study sacred doctrine. We look for encouragement. We look for the graces of the sacraments. We take a responsibility in order to deepen in our faith to seek the graces of conversion. That's actually heroic. There's a reason why when the risen Christ appeared to St. Paul, St. Paul had to go to the desert of Arabia for three years because he didn't understand what was happening. How could the sovereign God, the great I am, take on human flesh? How could this Jesus of Nazareth be this God, the living God, the one true God? He had to go into the desert for three years to figure it out. And that was virtue upon him. And that was his path of holiness. If we have an involuntary doubt and we're willing to wrestle with it in order to come to greater faith, again, that leads us to virtue. That's actually authentic discipleship. And that can actually be a path even to holiness. So we know our bishops have called us to a National Eucharistic Revival. Here at Our Lady of Grace, we take it seriously. If the bishops ask, we obey. The bishops have said, we have a revival. Local parishes need to do something. So here at Our Lady of Grace during ordinary time, because of that call to discipleship, we have taken on a homily series in order to walk through the parts of the Mass and the portions of the Catechism of the Catholic Church on the Eucharist. And we're doing this because we want to actively and consciously participate in the Holy Sacrifice so that by participating in the Holy Sacrifice, we can deepen in our Eucharistic faith and our Eucharistic devotion. So last week we talked about the parts of the Mass. This week we're going to dive into the Catechism of the Catholic Church. If you brought your catechisms, and I know sometimes we all forget, but if you brought your catechisms, you can actually turn with me to number 1370. Number 1370. But before we dive into the catechism, let me ask you, Team Grace, true or false, is there a catechism of the Catholic Church? Yes. Exactly. We know that here at Our Lady of Grace, but we know that the vast majority of Catholics do not know that. They don't realize that in one simple volume, you have all the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. That if someone tells you, well, Catholics believe this, you can flip into the Catechism of the Catholic Church and see exactly what we teach. If you have two priests telling you two different things about what the church teaches, you can flip to the Catechism of the Catholic Church 
and find out which one is a faithful shepherd and which one is a wolf in sheep's clothing. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is a tremendous gift. And we need to make sure we understand and know about it. You know, every once in a while, of course, we know here at Our Lady of Grace, but we have guests who come. Fellow Catholics, brothers and sisters in Christ who come. And oftentimes, after Mass, they'll say to me, or they'll drop me an email later, and they say, I never knew about the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I was traveling through your area, I stopped for Mass, and you were talking about the Catechism. I have no idea, I had no idea that this existed. So what do I do? <laughs> Reply, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here's a link to the Catechism. You can start with part three, huh, right? It gets you right in, just jump in, right? Because the Catechism is a gift given to us in our discipleship in order to understand sacred doctrine. All right, let's look at number 1370. We know 1370 is in the second part of the Catechism. How many parts are there in the Catechism? Four. What's the first part? Three. What's the second part? Seven. What's the third part? Four. What's the fourth part? Prayer. Exactly, that's the four parts of the Christian way of life. And the Catechism is broken up according to the different parts of the Christian way of life. Let me just ask you a fun fact on the side. Which part of the Catechism of the Catholic Church did your pastor spend years of his life studying? Morals. Morals, exactly, morals. Many of my professors were the ones who wrote the third part of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It was a great honor to study under these great scholars of our faith. So, okay, so four major parts. We're in the second part as a parish family, and we're on the part in the, on the Eucharist. Let's go there, number 1370. Now, let me tell you, we're going to do three numbers this morning, Teen Grace. And none of what we're going to read is going to be new to us. It might be new to many other Catholics, but it's not going to be new to us. Because here at Our Lady of Grace, we talk about worship, we talk about the Mass, we talk about the communion of saints. Do we love saints here at Our Lady of Grace? Yes. Exactly. Just look at all these statues and stained glass, right? So we talk about these things, so it's not going to be as much a surprise to us. But look how the church explains this. All right, 1370. Through the offering of Christ are united not only the members still here on earth, but also those already in the glory of heaven. In communion with and commemorating the Blessed Virgin Mary and all, all the saints, the church offers the Eucharistic sacrifice. In the Eucharist, the church, as it were, is, is as it were, at the foot of the cross with Mary, united with the offering and intercession of Christ. Wow. So, okay, we know that at the Catholic Mass, as the sacrifice is being offered, heaven and earth merge. They come together. Heaven opens up. And we know all the saints and angels are with us. Are all the saints with us? Yes. But when we say that, we just mean the canonized saints, right? No. All the saints. Yes. Exactly, because we know everyone in heaven is a saint. And there are some saints in heaven that are only known to us and to our families. Mother Church honors all those saints on November 1st, the Feast of All Saints, but at every Mass, we can honor the saints within our family because we know that they are united with us during the Holy Sacrifice. Now we know the saints are with us. Are the angels with us? Yes. My goodness, the angels flood this altar because they know what's about to happen. In fact, during the Sanctus of the Mass, we know the angels especially come to the altar because that's the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer. As a reminder to you, that's when the servers go and kneel on the steps. So if your mind's somewhere else and suddenly you see the servers moving to the steps, you can say, oh, oh, that's right, that's right, the angels are coming. And the angels are surrounding our altar. All the angels and saints are with us during the Eucharistic sacrifice. Who is at the, at the head, who is the main saint we always start with? With Our Lady, with Our Lady. Look, look how the Catechism words that. In the Eucharist, the church as, is, as it were, at the foot of the cross with Mary. Not to tell you, Teen Grace, that profoundly moved me the first time I read that. Because as a baptized Christian, we're called to participate in the sacrifice. We know that we are with all the angels and saints. But just the image of being at the foot of the cross with Mary. When you offer the holy sacrifice as a baptized Christian, do you realize Our Lady's presence? Have you allowed Our Lady's maternal presence to be with you as you are offering the holy sacrifice? Because she's with us, with all the angels and all the saints. Let's look at number 1371. The Eucharistic sacrifice is also offered for the faithful departed who have died in Christ but are not yet wholly purified so that they may be able to enter into the light and peace of Christ. So these are the souls in purgatory. So we have the church triumphant, it's the angels and saints. We're the church militant or the church pilgrim because we're still trying to work out our salvation. But then we have the church suffering. 
It's all the souls in purgatory who are still being purified by the Lord Jesus. Now we know at the time of our death, we're going to be, need to be cleaned up. Nothing unholy can be in the presence of God. So Lord Jesus comes to us once again as Savior and Redeemer, and he looks at us and he says, oh, you're a mess. <laughs> Let me clean you up a little bit. I've got some venial sins, got some temporal punishment, oh, got some attachment to sin. <laughs> okay, looking good. Now I can present you to the Father, right? That's purgatory. The Lord Jesus is doing the last cleanup of our souls in order to present us to the Father. And those souls who are in purgation, they're with us too. Now, let me highlight the saints over here, these, this mother and son. This is St. Monica, and she's with her son here, St. Augustine. This is very endearing because Augustine is shown as a boy. But Augustine grows up to become a playboy, right? He breaks his mother's heart. He's a drunkard, and he's a partier, and he's an illegitimate child, and all kinds of stuff, just wild. And Monica, his mother, continues to pray for him and for his conversion. Monica prays and sacrifices for over 10 years in order for her son to convert. Incidentally, Team Grace, this is why Monica is the closest of the female saints to the altar, because we're always asking Monica's intercession for those who have left, that they might return. So we see Monica, she's praying, she's fasting, she's offering sacrifice for Augustine's conversion. When Augustine converts, not only does he become a Christian, he becomes a priest, a bishop, and a great saint. In fact, the highest of saints, we call him a doctor of the church. He's referred to as the doctor of grace. And so his mother's prayers and sacrifices certainly paid off. Augustine is one of the preeminent mystics, spiritual masters, and teachers of our faith in the 2,000-year history of our church. Now, when Monica was dying, the two of them were in Italy. They were originally from North Africa. His mother's dying. It's breaking his heart because she brought him to Jesus Christ. And she's dying, and he says, Mom, don't worry. I will take your body back to North Africa. I will let your body rest with our family he thought that was important to her. I will make sure your body gets back to North Africa. Look at that first quote there in number 1371. <laughs> Put this body anywhere. Don't trouble yourselves about it. I simply ask, ask you to remember me at the Lord's altar wherever you are. <laughs> Is that a Catholic mama? She said, don't worry about where you're going to put these bones, right? Don't worry about that. But don't forget me at the altar wherever you are. Don't forget me at the altar. And here Monica is reminding us, do not forget your beloved dead at the altar of God. Now look at that second quote. This is from Cyril of Jerusalem. Cyril is also one of our great spiritual masters, an early teacher of our faith. Listen to what he says. Then we pray in the anaphora, that's the Eucharistic prayer, for the holy fathers and bishops who have fallen asleep. Do you know, dear friends, if you read the early writings of our faith, no one ever referred to uh, death. We simply refer to someone falling asleep. You know, the word cemetery simply means a place of sleep. So the Romans had necropoli, cities of the dead. Christians had cemeteries, the place where we go to sleep because of our belief in the resurrection. So uh, uh, Cyril continues, and in general, for all who have fallen asleep before us in the belief that it is a great benefit to the souls on whose behalf the supplication is offered while the holy and tremendous victim is present. Look at how he's describing Jesus. The holy and tremendous victim. Now what a powerful gift. We can pray for our loved ones in the midst of the world. We can offer fasting and prayers for our loved ones in the midst of the world who have died. But to remember them at the altar is particularly powerful because the holy and tremendous victim is present. Jesus is here as we are offering prayers and the holy sacrifice for our beloved dead. Cyril continues, by offering to God our supplications for those who have fallen asleep, if they have sinned, we offer Christ sacrifice for the sins of all and so render favorable for them and for us the God who loves man. So here Cyril is saying that it's so important that we remember our beloved dead, we offer supplications for our beloved dead at the altar of God during the holy sacrifice, and not only do our beloved dead benefit, but who else benefits? We do. Look at that. Christ sacrificed for the sins of all and so rendered favorable for them and for us. You see, dear friends, remember our beloved dead at the altar of God. Not only are they receiving grace, but we are too because we fulfilled the demands of justice, giving them what is their due. They're a member of our, of our family, their loved ones. They, we owe them something. 
fulfilling justice and fulfilling charity. So Cyril of Jerusalem is saying, we also benefit, we receive grace when we remember our beloved dead during the holy sacrifice. All right, let's conclude with number 1372. It shouldn't surprise us that the Catechism takes us back to St. Augustine. So here's a lead in. St. Augustine admirably summed up this doctrine that moves us to an ever more complete participation in our Redeemer's sacrifice, which we celebrate in the Eucharist. So that's an amazing lead in. Again, the church is showing great deference to Augustine saying he expressed this well in terms of this constant call we have to be a part of the Lord's sacrifice. Now listen to what St. Augustine says. This holy redeemed city, the assembly and society of the saints, is offered to God as a universal sacrifice by the high priest, who in the form of a slave went so far as to offer himself for us in his passion to make us the body of so great a head. Such is the sacrifice of Christians. We who are many are one body in Christ. The church continues to reproduce this sacrifice in the sacrament of the altar, so well known to believers, wherein it is evident to them that what she offers, she herself is offered. So there Augustine is focusing on the mystical aspects. We've talked about this a lot, that during the holy sacrifice, as members of the baptized, we get to be a part of the sacrifice. And by participating in the sacrifice, we receive the body of Christ. When we receive the body of Christ, we become the body of Christ. And then he goes on to say very beautifully that what she offers, she herself is offered to the entire church. Each of us, the whole church is offered to God the Father in Christ. So again, this is more the mystical perception, mystical understanding of this great mystery. All right, so Team Grace, that's three numbers there from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. What we're going to do in two weeks, we're going to come back to the Catechism. So next week, we're going to go back to the parts of the Mass. And then two weeks, we're going to come back to the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And the reason why we're doing this, Team Grace, is so that we can actively and consciously participate in the Holy Sacrifice. So we can understand what's happening here and the part that we're called to play in, in being involved in it, in being participating in it as baptized Christians. So the task of participating in the sacred liturgy is a demanding one. If you think you just come here and you can just kind of recline and take it easy, and that's what you're doing, you don't understand the Catholic Mass. When we come to Mass, we are at Calvary with Our Lady, and we are here in order to participate in the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus to the Father. The one historic sacrifice offered here, represented, made present here by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we are called to participate in that sacrifice so we offer ourselves in Christ to the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're doing this in order to be better disciples. The call to discipleship is real, to die to ourselves, to seek to follow the Lord Jesus. And if we're gonna follow the Lord, we need grace. We need his strength, his power. And the best, most eminent way to receive grace is a worthy participation in the Holy Sacrifice and the worthy reception of Holy Communion.